Hello there, lovely folks of YouTube. Ren here. I am in kind of an awkward little corner of my garden here, right next to my pond. Um, I want to talk about a plant that I'm not even really sitting next to. It's this one tucked way back here where I can't even really get next to it. Um, this plant is woodruff. Now the genus name on that is Gallium odoratum. It does go by other common names, sweet woodruff, woodruff, um, ladies bed straw, bed straw, Waldmeister or Master of the Woods being some of the ones I can think of off the top of my head. I can finally remember the name of this plant. <laughs> there are so many times where I've pointed out this plant on other things and just keep forgetting what it was called. Now I have it. It's Woodruff. Um, so this is ideally a very low growing ground cover. As you can see, it's covering my ground very nicely. Um, the stems can get to about 12 to 20 inches long but they don't really have a lot of strength to stand upright so they tend to just kind of flop along and trail along the ground uh, which again is that ground cover characteristic to it um why don't i get the camera in a little bit closer so we can get a really good look and we'll talk about some of the distinctive features in the appearance of this plant and how to take care of it all right Okay, so you can see a better look here. I moved some of these other plants out of the way, in particular this, um, the daffodil foliage that was, that's going to be dying back soon anyway. So the real, like, distinctive characteristic of this is these, like, lanceolate leaves that are in these big whorls together. So usually between, um, six and nine of these leaves, eight being the most common number. Um, now there are other plants that have whorls of leaves like this, cleavers being the one that comes to the top of my head. Um, but cleavers has like a really fuzzy, like sticky kind of stem. These are very smooth and has a very uh, smooth glabrous leaf to it. This plant will bloom. Um, it makes these little sprays of very pretty white flowers, usually in the late spring to early summer. Uh, mine is actually getting ready to bloom. I can actually see there's a couple spots here that I can see where there are some little flower buds that are getting ready. It's not quite time yet. Now, normally I would film plants like this and do the little plant videos when they're kind of at the peak, um, meaning like for this one, it would be when it's actually blooming. I decided to do this one a little bit early just um, because of the timing of uh, when this plant really holds some importance in the, uh, the Wicked Wheel of the Year. So. Anyway, um, as far as caring for this plant, this plant is a shade plant. It will grow in partial sun, but real, or um, partial shade, but really seems to do better in full shade. Does like moist ground. It can grow in drier areas, but basically the more water you give it, the happier it's gonna be. You can see my plant is right next to my pond where it kind of gets some little errant splashes from my waterfall. It's also right under my heat pump where the runoff from the heat pump basically goes right to that plant. So it gets pretty consistently moist, not sopping wet, but it's pretty consistently moist throughout the year. Um, and it really likes that. You can also see moss likes that same type of growth characteristic. So basically if moss will grow there, then the sweet woodruff will grow there as well. Now, although this plant does produce seeds, the most common way of, of um, propagating this plant is through division. So either just a crown division itself, or like you can take these little clumps here. These are the little stolons that have kind of, you know, it sends these little underground, you know, stems that will then basically bring up new bunches. So you could basically like this plant right here, you could dig right here and dig this up and you would have a whole new woodruff plant to plant. So that's usually the easiest way to propagate this plant. So um, historically, this plant was used primarily for its fragrance, uh, hence the name Ladies Bed Straw and Sweet Woodruff. Um, it was used um, in perfumes and other things like that as well. Now the fragrance is not really noticeable when the plant is fresh, but when you dry the plant, it becomes very strong. That sort of vanilla hay fragrance to it, it's delicious. Um, now that fragrance, of course, is due to coumarin which if you watched my uh, video on sweetgrass, you might recognize the name of that. It's the same compound in both sweetgrass and sweet woodruff that gives it its um, characteristics uh, fragrance. Coumarin is, as I've mentioned before, um, it, is, <laughs> it is a compound that we have isolated from this plant and used to turn into coumadin, uh, which is also known by the brand name warfarin, which is a blood thinner. 
So this uh, Coumadin does, um, and Coumarin both, will inhibit this um, synthesis of vitamin K, which is of course necessary for clotting factors, and that's why it helps to thin the blood. Um, Coumarin also has um, some hepatotoxic um, and nephrotoxic, which means it's bad for the liver and bad for the kidneys as well. And it's for that reason that it is no longer um, used in um, flavorings since the 1970s. It's been banned in most markets. Um, it is still available in Europe um, in select alcoholic beverages, but um, basically nothing that would be allowed to um, be given to the consumption of children. So. Because of that, um, be careful with ingesting this plant and make sure you're not getting too much of it because it will F you up. So, um, one of the most popular uses for this plant, um, and the reason why I chose to do this at this time, is that this is the plant that's used in the My Bowl, uh, which is the, um, the German wine punch that is traditionally served at Walpurgisnacht, uh, or what we more commonly known as Beltane. Um, basically, you would take a bundle of the woodruff, you would dry it for a couple of hours so that the, the fragrance would really come out of it, um, and then hang it into a bowl of white wine to let it steep for a few hours and infuse the flavoring in there. So that's a very traditional uh, Beltane beverage which is why I wanted to talk about this plant right before Beltane, even though it's not actually blooming yet. So why don't we come back where I can get somewhere a little more comfortable because I'm literally on my hands and knees right now <laughs> in order to film this. And then um, I'll talk about some of the magical properties of this plant. This is a little better. Um, you can't really see the plant from where I'm at, but I had to sit on an actual seat because um, it was hard on my legs, honestly. Just sitting in that position, it was at, really getting my sciatic up. So anyway, um, woodruff, a lot of the places, particularly if you look online, you're going to see woodruff under the jurisdiction of Mars. That comes from um, Scott Cunningham. And I can kind of see, like, I can see where he would get that uh, rulership of Mars being rulership of this plant, particularly when you look at it chemically and that, you know, that coumarin, which has an effect on the blood, um, you know, that sanguinous property is definitely a Mars property. So I can see where that's coming from. Um, however, if you look at um, Culpepper, Culpepper actually lists this plant as being under Venus, which again makes sense because of that sweet smelling fragrance and its use in, you know, perfumes and uh, as a strewing herb, you know, for its sweet fragrance and things like that. Ladies' bed straw. Sorry, I'm moving my notes. Um, so all of those things are Venus properties. Um, so there's, there's a bit of disagreement over the rulership of this plant between those two. Uh, now, of course, personally, I tend to side with Paul Bayero, who basically just splits the difference and goes, mm, no, actually, it's probably both, because plants can be more than one thing, just like us people can be more than one thing. So um, it probably does have rulership under both. And we can see that in some of the historical magical uses of this plant. So this is used as a protective plant. It was seen as, in the Middle Ages, it was used to drive away vermin and insects, um, or evil influences, because obviously vermin and insects and evil influencers are basically one and the same thing in the medieval mindset. So it does have a protective aspect, which of course is a Mars property. However, it also has a um, aspect of drawing in um, prosperity and abundance. Uh, which is a very Venus aspect as well. Um, and of course we can see that in the plant's habit of how it likes to readily spread, particularly in wet areas, because that watery, you know, Venus, Venus and, you know, water element tend to get along pretty well. Um, now, of course, you may think it's weird for a plant to have both Venus and Mars, because historically, you know, those are two as seen as the opposite. But also, if you look at our mythology, although they may be opposites, they have a really strong connection to each other. Um, and that holds true in a lot of other things in the plant kingdom as well, that sometimes you'll see Venus and Mars aspects really working together. I'm sorry, excuse me. <coughs> it's, we're deep in the pollening right now here in Virginia. So I'm getting a little overclamped. I've taken all my meds and it's just still not enough. But anyway, um, but yes, protective, prosperity, 
Um, this plant also was used, like I said, not only traditionally in a lot of the uh, Beltane or Wal uh, Walspurgis knot celebrations that happen around May. So it's very strong with that sort of like bringing in the, um, the new year energy. Um, also traditionally used um, to enhance male potency, which also can be seen as both a Venus and a Mars, hand in hand kind of thing working there. So, um, so yeah, those are the magical elements that we typically associate with this plant. Um, I think it's a delightful little plant, a nice little ground cover to have in that really awkward wet spot that I have there. I've tried to grow it elsewhere in my garden. It really did not like some of the spots because it was just too dry. But when I have it here where it's nice and wet, it has just exploded over the past year. So it's really happy there. Um, and it does have one other benefit that I forgot to mention. This is one of those plants that's actually resistant to um, some of the uh, allopathic um, uh, toxins that um, pine and black walnut will put out. So any of you who have either of those trees, you know how hard it is to grow something underneath those trees. Uh, woodruff will actually grow in both under both of those trees. They're resistant to um, to the um, allopathic com um, compounds that those trees put out. So that's another really great benefit of this plant. If you have an awkward shady spot under a pine or a walnut tree, you might be able to grow woodruff there. So anyway, that's all I have for you today. Hope this video finds you well, and I will see you again soon.